Welcome to another episode of Grief Talk. Everything you want to know about grief and more. I'm your host, Vaughn Solis. As an author, life transformation coach, online instructor, and bereaved mom since 2005, I'll be bringing you great content that is informative, inspiring, and practical. Whether you have suffered a loss or other adversity, stay tuned and tapped in as I cover a variety of topics to help you get where you want to go on your journey to heal and grow. Today's guest is Sunday Miller. With a background in organizational, people, and business development internationally, Sunday is a builder of dreams. She believes that the spiritual impacts business and leadership more than we think and knows the benefits of following core values rather than the money. She is passionate about helping people and organizations align with their core beliefs to discover what they really want to do, how they want to do it, and why to have the greatest impact and most fulfilling life personally and professionally. Welcome to the show, Sunday. I met you recently and we connected instantly and so I'm so grateful that you've come on the show to talk about all the things we're going to talk about today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, Vaughn. I agree that we most definitely made a connection beyond the superficial and I I really appreciate the opportunity of actually continuing this connection. Oh, for sure. For sure. So for my audience, um, if if you listen to the introduction, um, Sunday is very accomplished. She's got a couple BA science, French, her master's in business. Uh, her work took her uh, internationally uh, working in business growth. And um, uh, I, de- I define you, and I'm reading this because I didn't want to, you know, get it wrong, but as a problem solver, a strategist, a leader, an organizer, an author, you are an author, a provider of dreams, a spiritualist, and pretty, pretty well-rounded and accomplished there. And um, what I wanted to start with in this episode Sunday, uh, because we're going to be introducing people to concepts of uh, spirituality, um, uh, values in work professionally, personally, and how that can actually define far greater success in our lives when we're in touch with our core values and um, what we want to do how we want to do it, and why we want to do it. So folks tuning in, that is exactly what we're going to be covering uh, today. So let's start with you say that the spiritual impacts business in more ways than uh, we think. So I wanted to know if you could just expand on that. Um, Anything that we talk about here related to the business world, because I know that's, you know, a part of your background for sure. well, it all starts with the personal, in my view, anyway. What we do personally flows into, into business. So if we just, uh, you know, start a little bit about explaining uh, what you mean by spiritual impacts business more than we think and um, why this may be so. When I say the spiritual, um, and this may come up later, but mm-hmm. I am talking about the unseen and Um, I'm talking about our beliefs, which are not necessarily something that we can grasp hold of. And so when I, when I say that the spiritual is impacting business, it's basically because it impacts you. So we all have faith. We can't define it, but we all have faith. What it depends in, maybe we have faith in science. It could be uh, faith in a religion. It it could be um, faith in anything. Like, for example, we sat down in chairs. Mm-hmm. We didn't even stop to think as to whether that chair would hold us or not. We have faith. Yes, I understand right? that. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because we have faith in natural laws. Like, we don't worry that we're going to fly up into the air because we know gravity works, Mm -hmm. right? And we know that even though everything we see is material, but what we see is based on what we can't see. And I call that, that's the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, unfortunately, um, we are a three-part entity. We're body, soul, and spirit. And... We are taught to focus on what we can see. And yet what we see is the result of what we cannot see. 
Yeah. And so as as a human being, we we focus on the outward appearance of everybody, whether it's height, color, gender, whatever. That's what we focus on. And we do it to the detriment of what we cannot see, which is the spirit and the soul. And it's interesting because the soul and spirit will never die. They are eternal. Our body will die. Mm-hmm. The only thing that dies is what we focus on. And so when I say that the spiritual impacts leadership and business, it's because I believe that the spirit is the result. It comes from our our th- our thoughts, which are impacted or which come from our heart. Mm-hmm. So we talk about the brain and we talk about the mind, but they're two separate entities. Mm-hmm. And the um, the mind or the heart, whatever you want to call it, impacts the brain with the thoughts. The thoughts create the chemical responses through the the neurons and the synapses, and the body responds. And when we think of business, business is a service that we're offering to people, and we're offering it, why? Because of the way we think, because of Mm -hmm. the ideas we've come up with, because of of different things in that way. And where are those things coming from? Where are the ideas coming from? So that's why I say it's, it's impacting in a spiritual sense, because it's coming from um, like some people say well, it was it was my gut instinct. Yeah. It was it's just something that I felt, and I and I moved on it, and so that's where I say the proper flow of things should be spirit to soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions to body. So we offer our services because of our thoughts right? We think, okay, I'm going to do this. I'll bet you not that many people think about where'd the thought come from. Yeah, that that's, yes, that is the point. Yeah, I know. And I'm, and I'm just rephrasing it because um, you can join masterminds, you can join any kind of business coaching, you can do all these things. I've never once heard anyone ask, well, where'd that thought come from? They might ask why you want to do it, or how you want to do it to a degree, but it's always sort of shaped in the business uh, framework. Uh, And that's even making me think because I think a lot of people get stuck or lost or disconnected from who they are and what they want to do just because they don't really know where the thought came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's your work. So, wow. Okay. Um, And I don't know if that's too much to unpack today, but I do know just having a a light bulb moment and going, aha, where did I get that from? So you you mentioned gut instinct. Uh, some people might, well, even when it's purpose-driven Sunday. They, I don't know. Yeah, and intuition. And then the question is, what is that thought connected to? Like, is it connected to light mm-hmm. and love and mm-hmm. compassion? Or is it connected to dark, greed, jealousy, envy? Yeah. Because it will dictate what we do, and it will also impact the results we have. Yeah, of course. Wow. Uh, we're probably going to have to circle back to that just a little bit, because, I mean, that is a that is a lot uh, for anyone to think about, and it's even a lot for those of us that have been on a spiritual path, in my case, decades, and there are things we miss about that, because it's kind of, I'm not going to say surface, but... It's kind of, there are set sort of rules to a spiritual practice if you follow your your most popular leaders for decades. Maybe even going back to the, well, Napoleon Hill, wasn't he 19th century, late 19th, late 19th century? Yeah, a lot of work is based on Napoleon Hill, for example. So let's talk a little bit about the healthy soul because it would be really nice if um, for the audience we can, all of us, myself included, as as we speak Sunday, uh, consider while you're you're talking and sharing this wisdom, 
you know, yeah, what is that thought connected to? Where did the thought come from? But it's not just in one thing. It's everything we do. Yes. Right? Yes. So let's talk about the healthy soul, because that's all connected. Knowing the why, not, I don't think the how necessarily is as important, but the why from the thought, but where'd the thought come from? By the way, I just want to throw in, and I don't know if you uh, agree with this or have read this, studied it, believe it, mind is, uh, you know, in consciousness, like def definitely separated from the body. And I followed a little bit of work from Deepak Chopra, who, you know, and other scientists who had actual proof of that, if I am not mistaken. So when you say the mind is separate from the brain. From the brain, yeah. I also don't know how many people think about that. Yeah. Well, and how many people know that there's a conscious and a subconscious, and the subconscious is much more powerful than the conscious? But but what is impacting the subconscious? Again, but it's like we all, I think most of us would know about conscious, subconscious, but don't know necessarily at all what's in the subconscious and, and how it powerful controls people, yeah. shapes people, influences people, all of us. And maybe we can touch a little bit on that and how we can sort of at least be aware of it and get ourselves out of that when it's all negativity. Let's talk about the healthy soul Sunday. What do you mean by the healthy soul? You mentioned mind, emotions, thinking processes. So how we can think about ourselves more functioning first and foremost, well, you know, spirit, healthy soul. What does that mean for people? Yeah, I said that the soul is, is basically your mind, mm -hmm. it's your will, and it's your emotions. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult for you to be in health. It's very difficult for you to prosper if your soul isn't healthy. And the, and the reason I say that is because, well, number one, your emotions, they play a huge role in how we respond to things, right? Mm -hmm. And a healthy soul is one that has hope. A healthy soul is the one that sees the beauty around them. The healthy soul is the one that has a level of a sense of security and safety. But a healthy soul is also one that acknowledges that there's more than them, that they are not the be all and the end all. Mm -hmm. And so a healthy soul is the soul that regardless of what's going on, no matter how much turmoil is going on around them, they have peace. Mm -hmm. Because they have, they've made that connection with who they are mm -hmm. on the inside. Mm -hmm. And they've also recognized who they are. Mm -hmm. So they've made the connection with who they are and they've embraced it. Mm -hmm. And then they can be comfortable. And then when I say that, and when I say, identifying who you are. I'm saying that from a perspective of someone who believes that when everybody was birthed into this planet, mm -hmm. they were birthed in with a destiny. And I believe that when we are, are forming and creating and being developed in our mother's womb, all the gifts and abilities that we need to fulfill that destiny are incorporated within us. Well, I certainly love that. I actually guess I do believe that too. Um, but then anytime you, you speak to somebody about it who might challenge that, then they always go, well, what about free will? So I'll let you speak to that a little bit. But yeah, I do believe that we have a soul design for the incarnation and we come in a soul group and we have soul contracts. So I do believe that. But I also believe that a lot of people don't wake up to that are not connected to that purpose. I don't know if there's a difference between purpose and destiny. Do you think there's a difference? The way I would identify the difference between purpose and destiny is the purpose is the process and the destiny is the end point. I like that. I really, I, 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 could, I could definitely uh, agree with that. No problem. Yeah. There will be people that don't. Yes. Again, it's because of this free will. So let's talk a little bit about free will. Because you see, when you believe in destiny and purpose, it's our foundation. And I can just see the people, and we're not maybe going to answer this today, but that experience an awful lot of hardship 
And then they would say, it cannot be, it's easy to think about destiny when we're successful. It's very difficult to think about destiny when we're in pain and suffering and, and experience a lot of hardship, even starting from childhood. Yep. So what would you say to those people that would challenge the belief in destiny and purpose when, uh, when it is an incarnation filled with just so much pain, even, and mostly starting from childhood? Because that stumped me a little bit and in my own work. I'm very considerate of that and I, I get it because you see, I believe that we all have created our experiences. So look, it goes in line with purpose destiny. We've agreed to this before we come here. And I know there's gonna be people that go, no, no, no. And I've actually had uh, somebody leave a comment on uh, something I posted. And you know, I have a, a meditation for forgiving your parents, which a lot of say older millennials, middle mid millennials really gravitate to, and many many people are very angry at their parents. So let's starting just with that. When going back to what you say, so we come in the art, you know, in into the incarnation in our mother's womb, with it all planned out, and I'm just really generalizing here. And then you, we, you would for sure, we both would, would say, oh, yes, I agree with that. And then I say, yes, and take responsibility for it in the lifetime and through your lessons and wanting change or in the hardships that can lead to purpose. And what was the positive of that and all, you know, all that stuff. But it gets very tricky when we're dealing with issues of child abuse and, um, you know, violence and all of these, these things so what would you say to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that everything that happens to you is the plan because, and this is where free will comes in. Okay. There are people who can choose to do the wrong thing. And depending upon how we respond, that can also put us on the wrong path. So it's still a choice. I mean, it's it's like I was listening to someone speak. There were two two brothers. Their father was an alcoholic, and he was abusive. Ended up in prison. One of the brothers ended up just like his father. And they asked him, you know, how come this happened? And he said, "Well, what choice did I have with a father like what like I had that I grew up with?" the other brother asked him, they asked him about, you know, who he became. And he was a lawyer and a judge. Mm -hmm. And his response was exactly the same. How could I be anything different based on what I, on how I grew up? Yeah. So it's, it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond to it, which is what I call a healthy soul. Because we are, we're very powerful. If we can connect to who we really are on the inside, we are very powerful. Regardless of what comes against you, you can overcome. And you can get on your path and you can achieve what you're meant to achieve with joy and with contentment and with energy. And so mm -hmm. all of these things, whether it's, it's you know, abuse, uh, molestation, rape, um, you know, I mean, whatever kind of heinous thing that you can come up with, mm -hmm. it, it truly is a matter of your emotions and your will. We can choose to be resentful, to be angry, to be hateful, to be mean, to be vicious, to want revenge. Mm -hmm. That takes us down a path that doesn't lead to good. But again, it's a choice. And, and you know, it's one of the questions I've had people, you know, ask me, why is there all this evil? I said, it's a choice that we've made. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we make the choice because it makes us feel better. It makes us, in the moment, it makes us feel better to be angry, to be resentful, mm -hmm. to have hate towards a person. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, it harms us. Yeah, it's so interesting, Sunday. And I'll pop in here sometimes, well, probably every episode, I throw in a little bit of personal experience. People love stories. 
and we all have a story. Uh, so listen, I have been the, I really don't like the word victim, but I'll just rephrase that. I have experienced abuse. I had abuse, just vi like violent um, hitting and stuff, not sexual. Uh, from It started with my father and he wasn't always like that, but it was from a generation where that was how they disciplined and uh, it was, you know, and four kids in our family. And years later as an adult, I look back at that and I thought, hmm, uh, how, how did you feel as a child getting whacked on your bare bottom, uh, embarrassed and humiliated and all that stuff. But that also led into uh, violent relationships uh, where I experienced violence and even death threats in one relationship. And somehow, I'm not brushing it off as, oh, whatever, uh, but somehow I guess I came into the incarnation understanding I wasn't going to hold anybody else, anyone, or, you know, my parents, not any former relationships. I was, only, I was not going to hold them responsible for it. I was just going to get myself out of the situation. So the, uh, the will to just, yeah, no, that's not how I want to live without even uh, so making choices based on that without even understanding for years the the actual personal power we have to not succumb to that kind of living and some of it was in the 70s and some of it you know listen may have been just we're conditioned from 50s 60s and probably earlier mm, to be told put in our place uh, and certainly female be you know just the stuff we we've had to go through and I mean, unfortunately, that kind of violence still occurs today. So what I'm saying is it's not that I think you or me or anyone else adopting this type of practice or teaching it is, you know, is doing this and we have no clue what we're talking about. In fact, sometimes it's those experiences, if not all the time, it's those experiences that lead us to our power. Yes, yes. And, and I, I most definitely agree because if you're a victim, you can't change the situation. I know because it's in someone else's hand and and I will and you know I'll just tell you know I guess my story in, in the sense that you know as a young black woman growing up in Canada on the east coast I I couldn't understand when I walked down the street why people would say things to me and I remember going home and asking my mother, and she'd say, well, who said this to you? And I'd tell her this was yelled out the window or that was said. And then she would explain to me why they said that. And I was shocked that they would say things like that. They don't know who I am, but she let me know, well, they're making that decision based on the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. And that to me was very frightening because mm -hmm. I thought this is how people see me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very easy to become what people think you are. But then that means you become a victim. Yeah. And I looked within myself and I said, that's not who I am. I don't care what they say. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going down that path. I'm not putting up with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that started my process of knowing who I am on the inside Mm -hmm. What age were you? Oh, probably around 14 or 15. So I don't know if, if you want me to just say the word racism here, but you experienced race. It's yeah. just racism. Yeah. I'll be open. I'll be super honest. My daughter was mixed, half West Indian. I'm certain it played a role in her suicide racism. She experienced it. And I experienced it, believe it or not, and I'm not playing a racist card. I have not jumped into that cultural um, discourse is the best way of saying that. I have no right, but even I was called names for having my child. Yeah. Right from her as a newborn. I was living in a small community at the time, but I would never ever suggest that that impacted me. It just made me sad and sorrowful for her. But I was inexperienced and not equipped and didn't even understand how to have the conversation with her. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, and my mom did. I mean, and, and of course, you know, my background is, is, is challenging because, you know, my dad died when I was four. Oh. So mom was raising, you know, in her 30s, raising four kids. Oh, wow. And the prognosis wasn't good. And all of the negative things that people were telling her were going to happen to her kids. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, and my mother, she was mother, 
father and policewoman. Yeah. Wow. She sounds so powerful. Yeah. And she was. I mean, she had no intention of having her children become a statistic. You know? And even though people talk in those in those exact words today, we're talking a while back. The reason I'm saying that is the issue hasn't gone away. Still the same. Do you think it's worse today? Yeah, I think I think it's um it's taken a slightly different look because mm-hmm. we have things called diversity, equity and inclusion. But that hasn't made a difference because the whole issue is a heart issue. And it comes all back to the same thing. Who are you on the inside and what are your core values? I just want to jump in for a quick second. So even when we talk about we choose destiny and all that. So even where we live, the color of our skin the economic situation, you still say despite and even because of what you experienced from early on and no doubt your mom experienced, your dad experienced, your siblings. So even for the people who today are experiencing injustice in some way, shape or form, because almost every community feels they ha- there's an injustice. I, I feel that way in the bereavement community, but not in a negative way, just that we need advocacy and change and so on. But for those that it turns into perhaps violence or aggression or personal emotions bordering on the, as you say, hate, anger, revenge, and, and just a ton of emotions, do you still stand by, but we chose this? Uh, I'm I'm not saying that we chose that. I mean, obviously, I personally believe that there's not a demon in hell. There's not an evil government. There's not any kind of racist person that's going to be able to stop me from achieving my destiny mm-hmm. if I am committed to achieving it and I'm open to be guided mm-hmm. down the path and keep my heart open Mm -hmm. and not hardened Mm -hmm. Um, because number one they don't have that level of power and authority over me unless I give it to them so it's another form and I know that there's a lot about out there talking about racism and so on and so forth I'm not saying it doesn't exist it does exist it's not meant to exist but again those are people who have made a choice who I do not believe are fulfilling their purpose and their destiny. Right. I think what I'm really trying to get at here is we understand. So everything that applies to us personally and what you're saying, which I agree with. Yes. Well, I'll ask you, do you think, because I believe this, that we can even consider it in cultural, geographical areas that I chose to be this person with this color skin in this area with these cultural, social, if not global issues uh, including even experiencing war and all of that. And yeah. we're sort of getting into where even societies that are going through war, I believe that they even contracted to be there at a specific time to do whatever it is they need to do. And in many cases, like if we take even Ukraine fighting for democracy, like to hold on to that, and yeah. you know how the wall fell and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, it's a it's a really big conversation, I know, right? But I just want to give people hope that it, whatever skin color you have, what whoever you are, whatever gender you're born, you want to change it, you don't want to change it, you're a mom, you're not a mom, you're a dad, you're, you lose your kids, whatever. It's like our choice how we want to take responsibility and go, okay, I chose this, now what am I going to do with it? Yeah. For me, the the concept is being the best that you can be. No matter that's what, right. right? That's, okay. that's right. And that's your choice. Yeah. No matter, you know, look, when I th- see, and I can't think of his name right now, and he was born with no arms and no legs. Yeah. He's married with, what, three or four kids, and he has a global um, business where he's going around talking and encouraging. I mean, he's an inspirational, wow. motivational speaker. If anyone had the the right to pull the victim card, it'd be him. Yeah. Or and he's like, not. And so, but even when you look at the disability group, we used to call it disability 
uh, physically impaired. I don't know what we call it today. It changes. But I worked for a number of years with a guy who was a double amputee and he was an Olympian, uh, a para-Olympian. And he was so cool. But the thing about it is he would joke about, you know, we might be in meetings and he might joke and say, if you don't do this, I'm going to take off my leg and, you know, wh whack you with it. And so, you know, a lot of it can come with humor. He never made himself, ever made himself a victim. He lost his legs when he was six in a tragic accident. And um, so it's not like he was born like this. He had to adapt to it. So before we move on, I just, I'll say, and then if you want a last word on it, it's just our situations, What one of the things that really impacted me, of course, was losing my daughter to suicide. So for me, that was kind of like, I could think I could get through just about anything else. That has been my toughest lesson in this life so far. And in bereavement, you don't think about color. You don't think about, you know, anything. You just think about the, basically the loss. Um, but I always look to, you know, see and remember who was going through something worse than me. And that always helped me kind of see a bit of a light. So I only lost one child. Some people lose two or all of their kids. And it also helped me develop a lot of compassion and empathy. And so that's all I want to say about that. Do you have anything else you want to say? I know that was a lot and I didn't plan on speaking about that, but I think it's really important because I think that in many societies, it's almost a culture of victimhood. Yeah. And I don't want to get in trouble for saying that with anyone but they've been trained it's indoctrinated it's come with the media it's like you yeah. can't you need us you can't yeah. do your you do it yourself one of the other things i would like to say about a healthy soul it, it is a choice that we make and the healthy soul i honestly believe i believe that there are two forces just like in science and everything there's a good there's a bad there's a yin there's a yang and you have to figure out what you're going to yield your soul to. That will determine whether you rise or whether you stay a victim and become someone who's who's angry, resentful, um, someone needs to pay, which I think is part of the reason we have all the violence. Oh, my God. That, someone that, owes me. Yeah. At the bottom of it all, Sunday, I believe all violence comes from pain. And people who suffer incredible I've had many conversations with people about how we come here and we're these innocent beautiful little souls and then life happens and so I believe bullies uh, are born from pain any any type of you know no using you know the, that kind of physical power to make themselves feel less hurt and that's just what I believe. Yeah, hurting um, people hurt people, yeah. What I'm taking away from this bit of the conversation is, folks, think about yourself as soul more. Because when you do, it removes you from the physical. And we talk about soul in like really large terms out there somewhere where, you know, you can't really understand what soul is. But I'm feeling from you, Sunday, we're talking very much soul as being just right here with mind us. will emotions yeah there those you are go. tangible you know when tangible. you're when you're feeling anxious why are you feeling anxious yeah. identify yeah. it what's exactly. causing it exactly so you've actually put something tangible to something that otherwise remains quite intangible uh for for people and i uh, and i love that and i'm thanking you for that because i'm going to think about that as well instead of this greater bigger entity uh that makes me feel more separate from it that power than connected to it yeah. um that probably ties into uh having us now quickly no i'm kidding uh <laughs> talk about People working too hard for the wrong reasons. So all of this plays into, if you think about this, become conscious about this and even have this work in your subconscious, you won't be working too hard for all the wrong reasons. But do you have any um, tips and wisdom to share with people to watch for it, that that's what they're doing? And in general, why are people working way too hard for all the wrong reasons, which is making them into this really sad and sick society in my opinion we have been trained to go to school 
mm-hmm. get a good education, and mm-hmm. get a job. We have not been trained to figure out why we're here, what mm-hmm. our gifts and abilities are, what are the things that give us joy, mm-hmm. and to follow them. We have been told to follow money. Money is a cold god, but we have set money up because money supposedly gives us position in society and it gives us things, Mm -hmm. you know, toys. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like everything else. If you meet someone, what is the first thing they ask you? What do you do? What do you do? Because then they want to know, okay, how much respect do I have to give you? Yeah. yeah, that's a whole reason. Are you more important than me? Yes, and, and folks, listen, I just want to s- step in here for a second. If you have gone through some struggle, real adversity, or any loss, and you're, you're, you're not doing anything at the moment, it makes you feel like you are not part of society and never can be because you can't keep up at the level that we're expected to in terms of position, physical power, and worth in every way that we can contribute to society. And boy, did I go that go, go through that for a number of years, right? I love what you said. So what would you say to the people who aren't as accomplished, can't go to university, can't get that degree? There's a lot of people that will never experience what that's like. The reality is there are low-level jobs. And there are those who enjoy doing those low-level jobs. There's nothing wrong with you doing it if you enjoy doing it. It's another right. thing to be doing it because you have no other option. That's the group I'm speaking to. Right. And I would say you do. The only reason why you're saying you don't have any other options is because you don't know what you're gifted to do. Okay. don't know what your ability is. That's why I say you need to figure it out. Who are you? What what were you brought into the world with? Are you creative? There are people who enjoy serving people. There are those who enjoy cooking it and feeding people. There are those who, who enjoy making things. Yeah. And there are those who are administrators. They really just like, you know, to, to make plans. There are those who just want to deal with numbers. What is your gifting? What gives you joy? What is the thing that when, you, when you're doing it, you're feeling so at peace, so contented? That's your gifting. I look at it this way. Uh, one position that I had, we we worked with uh, young people who were intellectually challenged. So many of these had amazing gifts, amazing gifts. And I know that parents had them in the program because they were concerned, what are they going to do after high school? Mm-hmm. What are they going to do after high school? And in my mind, I'm thinking, they can have their own home-based business. They can hire accountants. They don't have to do the accounting. They've got an amazing gift that will enable them to live independently. But people didn't see it because yeah. all they saw was that this is not someone who can get a university degree or a college diploma. And, and my response is, we need to get away from that. We need to say, what does the person bring to the table? Is it compassion? I mean, what is it? And, and the thing is, there are people who are doing jobs because it pays the most money and they hate it. You know, the statistics, I believe, indicate that around 70 percent of people hate their job. Wow. I'm not surprised. And so it's that 70 percent. We're talking to you. And I want to just make it very, very clear. I am not judging anyone in a lower level job. I have done them myself. What we're talking about is if you hate it, like I did, I worked in a a gas station, but you know what I loved? It was actually just after my daughter died and I I felt I had to save our family financially because my husband was, you know, working for himself and he had to take a bit of time off work and stuff like this. And I was panicking. I have PTSD and I was panicking. And anyway, so I thought, you know, my minimum wage job at the time, 7.75 an hour, I think it was. Working at this, uh, our corn, our village gas station. But, you know, I loved, it was a little liquor store as well. And I loved running the bottles through the scanner. 
And I don't know, maybe I don't know what it was, but I just loved that feeling. So I moved from there and go, I went into a grocery store thinking I must love cashiering. Well, I didn't. And I, I really didn't. So it, it obviously something else was going on for me with the liquor bottles. Then I went and I was a support worker, a personal support worker. None of these are glorified jobs. And in fact, um, all of them were low paying. But it all led me to build confidence and understand and have the faith that you talked about that somewhere deep inside me was still a person of worth and value and intellect and just because other people couldn't see it. So I'll tell you something that I learned from that. When you're forced to wear a certain color t-shirt, so in the gas station, it was this drab green thing, customers treat you what they expect you to be. In, the, in my case, not educated, only worth a minimum wage job, and there was zero respect for me. Now, not everybody treated me like that, but we remember the ones that do more than the ones that don't. But it was more that what you said earlier, we're taught how to be who we are in, in almost any given moment, unless you're wise up to it. And I struggled to understand that, well, that job, and I worked with people, that was their career. That's what they did. And they loved it. But that wasn't me. And my soul and my spirit was crying out for respect. You know? And so I've been there. I'm not paying lip service to this. And my guess Sunday is you've had your own experiences. You're not paying lip service to this. this. So any situation you find yourself in that's not bringing you something that you feel aligned with, it doesn't even have to be pure joy at this moment, does it? Mm-hmm. Just, no. rec- just a recognition this isn't me. So what can they do? The people that are are struggling right now, and you just said 70% are miserable or hate their job. Yeah. Well, number one, they have to get honest with themselves. You, you mm-hmm. can't change anything for the better if you're not going to walk in truth. And mm-hmm. the first one you have to be honest with is yourself. And so you have to... Number one, ask yourself, what am I good at? And ask your friends, what do you think I'm good at? You know, and and admit to yourself what I'm not good at and that you don't like doing. You, you, You have to be honest and upfront with that. And then you have to just, once you compile, like do a spreadsheet. And I'm in the process of putting together a, a, a spreadsheet that I'm going to have available on my website to help people identify their giftings or their abilities. Because there are so many things you've got administrating, you've got service, you got, I mean, there's all of these different areas where you might fit in. And I'm going to try and, and put a pre- uh, spreadsheet together that's going to identify all of these different things that you could be doing. And maybe it means that these are your strengths, your areas mm-hmm. of strength, management, administration, service, mm-hmm. you know, and so on and so forth. And you have to figure it out, what is it that I want to do? And and also ask yourself, what kind of an environment do you want to work in? What's important? Like, is it important that you don't have an office with a window? If the goal is to find who you are, what you're good at, what you don't like to do, because that's just as important eliminating. And then if, if you are choosing to work for someone else, so it's finding a company that is aligned, hopefully, with our own values. And I think that's rare. Is it rare? I I think you can find it, but you're going to have to do the research. And then what, if you find a company that has values simil- similar to yours, if you're honest with yourself and mm-hmm. identify truly what your values are, mm-hmm. then you have to you know do the research, find that company, and then find out whether they actually have any positions available. And one of the things that I have found is that sometimes they've got the values listed, but their actions and their activities and the culture is not supporting those values um, because... They're doing what they need to do to for the bottom line. Yes. And there's some of them doing it to attract the employee, get the employee in. And then, yeah, we're really not like that. Well, I'm working with smaller companies, but I have to be honest and say the pandemic has caused a lot of people to be either on short-term disability or retired or gone um, for really? different reasons. Yeah. Yeah, so there's some kind of shift going on. 
Let me ask you this Sunday. Are you seeing quite a shift in um, business practices and people leaving jobs because of the pandemic? Yes, I have. Yeah. Do you think a lot of people became entrepreneurs, switched jobs? What's happened? Oh, oh I, I think some switched jobs. Um, uh, others, I know their comment was, I didn't sign on for this. Do you think the way we're doing business is changing? Yeah, it's changing, but I don't know that it's changing for the better. And and the, uh, the only reason why I say that is because I'm no longer convinced that the benefit to humanity or the well-being of humanity is the number one goal. I do believe, unfortunately, that money has become so important in our culture and society um, that businesses will do whatever they have to do for the bottom line, even if it does mean uh, people are harmed. So we're speaking generalities uh, here. We're not saying all businesses like this. Wasn't money always the bottom line for companies? Yeah, yeah. You don't uh, go into business to lose money. You you go in to make money. But it would seem to me that you were willing to abide by your core values a bit more. So we've lost those. Yeah, I think they got put to the side. And I think the reason part of that happened with the pandemic is because so many things that, especially in the Western world, we believe would never have been violated, that they would have been sacrosanct, were violated. Can you just give a quick example? Well, I don't know that um, anybody would have thought that they would have been forced to get a vaccine. Or lose their job because they didn't. Lose their job or not be allowed to travel. Because that's, that is a human rights issue. So one would never have thought that in Western society that people's human rights en masse would have been yeah. violated. And I think because that happened, that caused a switch. It's, it's down, it's underneath, mm. but it filters out. You have to look at the results. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist. You do yeah. something, what are the results? The results speak for themselves. I mean, you know, if you put this in motion, if you're going to drop this ball, yeah. gravity's going to do what it does. It's going to take it down. Yeah. And so when you put certain things in motion, there are, are repercussions to that. And I think... Well, we're in a, we're in a mental health crisis. Yes, everywhere and because of what's been done. And it's a form of demoralizing of people, yeah. which makes it really difficult for people to go inside and find out who they are. It's, it's like it's, everything's been put in place to prevent people from becoming their best selves. Because oh. if you become your best self, then you are not going to allow yourself to be a victim and be controlled. That's right. So the question is, who's the one thinking they're holding all the control today? Well, that's the good question, isn't it? You know, and when there is a, any crisis, one would think that if we're already in crisis, we're already victims. Mm -hmm. But we can change it. The reality yes. of it is chaos is a great opportune moment for either a dictatorship, totalitarianism, and abuse of people in general. And I would have a tendency to say that what we've gone through over the last three years has been chaos and fear. And with fear, you can control. Chaos and fear controls. But also chaos and fear prevents a person from going within because they're just looking at the surface. They're seeing the surface as the issue. It's, it's what we can see. And aren't we just too busy trying to survive? Yes. And that's the whole point. You can't thrive. We want you to just survive. Now, we, the ones who are doing this, we want to thrive. But we want to thrive by making sure that you don't. Yeah, well, I think one of the uh, institutions that must believe they're in control is our media, what they feed us. And um, it's a wonder most of us can sleep at night when we're thinking about all the things that could go wrong in the world. So we're at the top of the hour Sunday and you and I could just go on and on and on and we can't. I want to leave people with, I think the focus of this episode has largely been around 
You don't have to be powerless. You are powerful. You don't have to be a victim. You can make choices to get yourself out of anything. There are solutions. Let's close on the reality is in the unseen. You already alluded to that in the beginning. But let's leave people with some hope. (laughs) Because, you know, the thing is, we can have these discussions, and then we'll go back to our lives. And for those of us that are living comfortably, and, and you know, whatever, we can be grateful and appreciate it and all the rest of it. But that's not what this is about. This is about remembering times that were difficult. We've all come from something. So let's talk about the reality is in the unseen. Yes. So as I said earlier, um, we're three parts. We're body, soul, and spirit. And the soul and spirit is eternal. And when I say that the reality is in the unseen, the reality is truly the unseen. It's what's going to last forever. And it's not your body. It's what you think. And it's what you feel. And it's what you are connected to, what you're allowing your thoughts and your feelings to be connected to. My belief is that there is a power higher than us. Um, And there's a power lower than us. And we can choose which power we connect to. If we connect to the power that's higher than us, then that power will help us to become the best that we can be. That power will help give us insight and wisdom and help us navigate and will help us solve the crises that are going on all around us. But we have to be able to be open to the power that's above us. If we choose to go towards the lower power, it will take us down because that power is all about stealing, killing, and destroying. And I think just by looking at what we have in our society. We have a little bit too much of that going on. My response is, I know that for myself, when I am confused and I don't know what I'm doing, you have to have a quiet time. You have to take time and go sit someplace quiet. It can be in the woods. I love being in the woods. In the woods, I can commune with nature and I can connect with the higher power. And so my response is that you need to find a place where you can be quiet with no interruptions and you need to go in and you need to pour your heart out in truth and honesty. It's, it's, like, it's like having a pipe that you want the water to flow through. You want the creativity. You want the love. You want the compassion. You want it to flow through, but it's all clogged up. It's clogged up with, with anger and jealousy and resentment and hurt. And the higher power, the the love, and it will actually wash those things out. But you've got to be able to to get to a place where you can connect with the power so it can cleanse you. Mm -hmm. I 100, yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah. So for those of us that have been in this type of practice for many decades, years, I just want to let people know This isn't an overnight process getting to this place where you can quickly center yourself, where you can quickly make better choices, where you understand you're so connected to yourself, you understand when you're out of alignment. This is a process, but I promise you, when you just kickstart it, more and more and more, you know, opportunity uh, comes in for you to practice making this, you know, a very precision oriented tight way of getting yourself back to balance. So this has been great Sunday. My goodness. Pleasure. (laughs) My goodness. I went to your website, godsunconsulting.com. Yeah. And there's a wealth of information uh, there Sunday uh, that uh, you've provided uh, for people. What are your resources? I'm actually working at trying to Uh, assist people with identifying core values. I'm working with uh, organizations that they actually want to revamp, take a step back and say, okay, what is our focus? What are we doing? And is it lining up with who we say we are? And on the website, you probably saw my newsletter who showed the interconnectedness between spirituality, leadership, and business. 
And yeah. so there's information there and a couple of resources and links, you know, that people can read if they want to get some more information. And a way to contact you. They can find that as well on, on the website. So people can sign up for your newsletter, which yes. I'm sure you're going to be providing thought-provoking content. Did you want to just speak very briefly to your yes. study? I create Bible studies and I did one and it was called Abraham Patriarch of Faith. And I did it because he has been used as the foundational person that people like the Muslims, the, the Jewish people, the Christians, um, a lot of people identify him as someone who exhibited faith, someone who came from a background of being an, an idol worshiper and producing them to someone who had strong faith and who was blessed. And so the whole study is to, to look at his life and how did he go from someone who was controlled mm -hmm. and maybe even a victim, yeah. someone who was very insecure mm -hmm. and frightened to a very powerful man. Oh. And so it's it's basically his growth and development. I, I was talking to someone who had actually done the study with me and she said, it changed my life. She goes, wow. I realized, she goes, and she, this is for her word. She goes, I realized I no longer had to be a victim. Wow. It sounds powerful Sunday. You have to do the work. Like, you know, I tell you what to read. I ask you the questions, but it's where you have to unpack it. See, that's the only way we can grow. We have to unpack truth for ourselves. Otherwise, it's just information. And information doesn't necessarily lead to transformation, but revelation leads to transformation. I love that. And I, why we're so afraid of ourselves, I don't know, but... You know, it's a really fun adventurous journey finding out who you are. And every, and every I, step of the way, because stuff yes. happens and we have to keep revisiting that because we do change. Those of us on this path, we do change and transform. I just really feel if there's no introspection, you can't change. Life's happening to you, not for you. That's right. I am toying around, throwing out the idea of doing a Zoom with this study. And um, yeah, and, oh, and just so getting a group of people and then having us interactive. Oh, well, that'd be so exciting because community is so important today. Anyway, Sunday, this has been amazing. I just feel really um, just inspired uh, from having the conversation. So I do want to thank you so, so much for coming on uh, my podcast. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Vaughn, for inviting me. And it was a great conversation. Oh, it was so much fun. Okay, thanks again. 